Welcome back to Face the Nation. There is big news in our CBS News Battleground Tracker. That's our survey of the Democratic candidates and how they're doing in the early contest. There are 18 states in our aggregate, starting with the Iowa caucus up through Super Tuesday. And there is a big reshuffling in the top tier. Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren is now at 26% support just ahead of former Vice President Joe Biden at 25 percent. The third candidate in our top tier is Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. He has 19 percent support. In the second tier, those are the candidates with higher single digits. California Senator Kamala Harris now has 8 percent support. South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg has 6 percent. Former Texas Congressman Beto O'Rourke has 4 percent, and former San Antonio Mayor Julian Castro and New Jersey Senator Cory Booker are at 2 percent. The rest of the field comes in with 1 percent of the vote or less. Joining us now is CBS News Elections and Surveys Director Anthony Salvanto. Anthony, always good to have you here. Tell me about this reshuffling. Well, this is a story of Elizabeth Warren rising, not necessarily Joe Biden falling. He is about where he has been. But her support and that boost she's getting is as a result of other candidates, now former supporters, moving to Elizabeth Warren. And we've seen this because in this survey, we've gone back and re-interviewed thousands of voters since the summer. And what we see is, in particular, from Kamala Harris, her supporters are now moving to Elizabeth Warren and at twice the rate that they've moved to Joe Biden and to other candidates. So she's clearly picking up some of them. She's consolidating a little bit of the liberal side of the Democratic Party. And also, her electability ratings are on the rise. She's 16 points higher in being perceived by Democrats as being electable, as being able to beat President Trump. And that's always been a key criteria. And lastly, you know, Margaret, I want to emphasize, this is in those early 18 states that you mentioned where the campaigns are really focusing. They're the first ones to hold contests. And so that movement really reflects, I think, where the campaigns are putting their energy. So Warren's gain is Harris's loss, but what does this mean for Joe Biden? Well, there's still some good news here. He's still up in our delegate count, and here's what that means. And I know it sounds like it's a far off thing. There's the Democratic convention next summer, but ultimately this campaign is a fight for delegates, and delegates are handed out to top finishers in all of these states, really any candidate that gets above 15 percent. Well, by the time you get through all of those states, Joe Biden is doing well enough. He's racking up a lot of delegates, a lot of votes in places like South Carolina, that he still has the overall delegate lead in that estimate when we take these vote preferences and we translate them into how the delegates would be awarded in the states. So that's important still to actually clinching the nomination. Yeah, by the time, you, when you get to next summer and you're at the convention, right. the balloons drop. That's how the delegates are actually awarded to candidates. So let's take a look at some of those key states. Yeah. Um, and we have them here. We'll bring them up on the screen. Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Nevada. What are they telling you? Iowa is tight. It's still with Biden ahead, just narrowly over Bernie Sanders. But then some news out of New Hampshire, where we know that War, War, uh, Elizabeth Warren has been really ramping up, staffing up, campaigning a lot. She is now very narrowly ahead of Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. That's effectively a three-way race there. South Carolina, I mentioned Joe Biden still has a substantial lead there. African-American support, really critical. And then in Nevada, often overlooked, mm -hmm. but an important early primary, we've got Bernie Sanders narrowly up on Joe Biden. So with this information, what do people do with it? What do they predict going forward? I think what you watch is who has room to move and room to grow, by which I mean, are candidates being considered by voters, even if those voters aren't making them their first choice yet. And what we see is that Elizabeth Warren does seem to have even more room to grow because she's being considered now by more than half of Democratic voters, even the ones who aren't making her their first choice. When they describe the candidates, mm -hmm. not she's seen as electable or increasingly electable, but that's still Joe Biden's strong suit. He's and still seen as the most. Means being able to beat President Trump in the minds of mm -hmm. in the minds of Democrats, and that's really been a top criteria for them. They want somebody they think can go on next November 2020 and beat President Trump. Thanks so much, Anthony Salvanto. And as always, all of the results are available on our website at facethenation.com. We'll be right back with our political panel.
It's time now for our political panel. Jamal Simmons is a Democratic strategist and host on Hill TV. David Frum is a staff writer at The Atlantic. Michael Crowley is a White House correspondent covering foreign policy for The New York Times. And Laura Baron Lopez is a national political reporter at Politico. Good to have you on Face the Nation. Thank you. We just revealed that battleground tracker that moves Elizabeth Warren into the top spot. Is that also what you've been hearing out there on the campaign trail? Yes, we've seen, uh, as, I, if, as I've been on the campaign trail, as a number of my colleagues have been, we've seen this slow and steady rise from Warren. She has very systematically put a lot of boots on the ground in places like Iowa and New Hampshire and Nevada. She's been very methodical about getting data on voters, and she has been trying to really utilize her niche, which is I have plans for almost everything, and she's really heavily leaned into that, and it appears to be working because she is slowly gaining on Biden. But it also suggests, according to our polling, that there is more attraction to this idea of the progressive wing of the party, Jamal. Yeah, I think my, my math for this election has been pretty consistent. You, we, the Democrats need a progressive that they can sell to the center, not a centrist that they have to sell to the progressive, uh, to the progressive wing. I mean, that's sort of what the John Kerry election was in 2004. That's sort of what the Hillary Clinton election was in 2016. Those didn't work out very well. Um, I would just say this. If you look at the history of uh, Matt, the New Hampshire primary, then five times a Massachusetts official has run in the New Hampshire primary, Democrat and Republican, since 1988. The, each one of those people either won the, Massachusetts, the New Hampshire primary or they came in second, like Romney, but all of them got over 30 percent. Mitt Romney got the lowest at about 31, 32 percent when he ran in 2008. So the idea, the, the probability is that Elizabeth Warren will win the New Hampshire primary. What does that do to Joe Biden, whose entire uh, election is predicated on mm -hmm. him being the winner when he may not be winning? David, you saw in just the past few hours another entrant into the Republican race. Mark Sanford, the former congressman from South Carolina, wants to challenge President Trump. Trump campaign says, eh, it's irrelevant. Is um, it? Well, they have certainly made it so that Mark Sanford will not be able to vote for himself in his own state's primary because they have shut down the state primary. Donald Trump is so popular in the Republican Party that he does not want Republicans to vote on his renomination. That's how popular he is. Um, there. Uh, the, the story of the Republican it's Party. It's not unprecedented that the caucuses have been canceled in some it is, states. It is not unprecedented, but it is something where a, when a president wants to demonstrate uh, the, the strength of his support in the party, that these kinds of acclamations can, can be useful. Um, the key to uh, Donald Trump's position in the Republican Party is a problem of, of fractions, which is that he is getting a bigger and bigger share of a smaller and smaller party. Bigger and bigger share of a smaller and smaller party, um, but yet not willing to count him out. Um, well, that he's going to be the nominee, I think that we count him in. Um, no, but it, potential re-election. His, his potential re-election, um, I think, suddenly looks worse this fall uh, than it did this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the story um, that things are beginning to go wrong. The price of his policies is arriving. Um, the bread and butter issues, you can just see everywhere around us the signs, not of economic trouble, actually, but of economic warning. And we're seeing consumer confidence leaking. Um, we are seeing the financial markets reacting badly. And we're seeing that, that the things that the president might try to do to save the economy are temperamentally unavailable to him, that, he, that to find some way of reaching some kind of agreement with the Chinese on taking off the table the stupid things that we're arguing about, like washing machines and focusing on the important things, intellectual property and the security mm -hmm. of the 5G, 5G network. He can't do that. Um, and the consequences of his inability are affecting real people's wages, yeah. which are now flat, and soon will be affecting real people's jobs. And uh, Michael Crowley, President Trump has sold himself as a deal maker. We just saw another potential deal literally fall apart in the yeah. past 24 hours yeah. with yeah. Afghanistan. Yeah, it, well, first of all, what an amazing turn of events. Uh, I think that much of Washington was prepared for a big announcement that they had reached a conclusion. Now everything is kind of in pieces on the floor. And it's an example, I think, of how, you know, the president practices this kind of wild seat of the pants diplomacy. Um, it reminds me a lot in broad strokes of his approach to North Korea, the North Korean dictator Kim Jong un. You know, I'm going to go meet with this guy who had basically never been with, met another foreign leader before. Everyone was astonished. You can't do that. 
yes, I can. Um, this Camp David thing would have been the same thing. You know, this is this is crazy. What are you talking about? The Taliban is going to come to America. They're going to come to Camp David a few days before 9-11. And this is how the president operates. And I think he loves to kind of gobsmack us and also thinks that by kind of breaking through these walls, things become possible. But, Margaret, uh, we're not seeing the results. I mean, his diplomacy with North Korea has essentially gone nowhere. Uh, Kim Jong-un is still producing nuclear material at a pretty steady pace, launching short-range missiles. He, yes, he has stopped some tests. And Afghanistan now, uh, you know, this peace process is in tatters, and who knows what happens next. So this president's improvisational, wild style, I think, you know, earlier in his administration, some people thought, wow, he might actually be able to get some things done that other presidents couldn't with their conventional ways. I think there's a lot more skepticism about that right now. And yet this is a popular thing to run on for Democrats. The idea of ending the war, bringing the boys home, is something every single candidate says they're going to do. Very few have actually detailed how they're going to do it. Does this force Democrats to answer those questions now, or do we just move on to the next crisis? <laughs> I, I think a bit of both. I think you might see some Democrats trying to answer that, uh, to strike another contrast with Trump. But again, a lot of uh, what's going on, on the, during the pri in the primary race right now is very insulated. They aren't always reacting to Trump or what he is doing in the immediate sense. They're staying focused on the plans and the visions that they want to bring to the voters. And this may be an opportunity for uh, all normal politicians to reintroduce the uh, the American people, the basic concepts of operationality. Now, there are reasons why these kinds of discussions are handled at the special envoy or assistant secretary level and not brought to Camp David until there's a success to announce, um, that, that you do not commit the president's time, and maybe Democratic candidates could begin. Because I think one of the great thing challenges for the country in 2021, if there's a Democratic president, is all this progressive energy you describe um, is going to find itself what, running into a whole series of objective walls a probable Republican majority in the Senate. Terrible fiscal problems, even if there isn't a recession. Much worse fiscal problems if there is. Um, the intractability of the health care problem. Uh, so I want that, that the, this moment, which is not central to people's voting concerns, is a good moment to say, these problems are hard, they are difficult, we are not making promises, we certainly are going to do our best, mm -hmm. but we're going to do our best through channels, and we're going to have a special envoy in Afghanistan, not the president doing seat of the pants diplomacy, as Michael calls it. Jim Maul, I want to ask you as well about, you know, pre gaffes, I guess, is sure. the word we can use uh, on the campaign trail. Kamala Harris, uh, who we showed mm. in our poll, was uh, losing some ground to the benefit of Elizabeth Warren, um, had to apologize for something she said at a rally this week. Or uh, let's listen to what she said. There needs to be accountability. I mean, what are you going to do in the next one year yeah. to diminish the mentally retarded action of this guy? <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> well said. I played that so people could judge for themselves. What was she laughing at? You know, it was a bad moment. And I think her campaign would have come off better if she had said after this, when they asked her, you know what, I reacted poorly to that. I wish I hadn't, instead of saying she hadn't heard it. But that's what happens in campaigns. Campaigns have bad moments. Elizabeth Warren is still trying to get past the Pocahontas and the DNA and all that other stuff. Campaigns have bad moments. The next question is, what are you offering the people? Right? Donald Trump is going to say all the things that it is he's going to say about the Democratic nominee. The question is, what are you offering people that they want to be out there and before, and they're going to go and rally behind you because of that, despite whatever mistakes it is that you've made? And I think people are still waiting to hear from Kamala Harris a concise message about what those things are. Excuse me, about what those things are. Crowley, um, Sharpie Gate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking. Right. What uh, do we make of it? Well, look, you know, we, we've all, uh, we know the details by now of the president taking his Sharpie to his hurricane map. And um, on some level, it's a total theater of the absurd. Uh, on another, I think it's, uh, you know, encapsulates American politics right now. Um, you know, the president essentially uh, tried to distort fact. He got the facts wrong, then tried to retroactively distort them. Looks like he enlisted government officials to back him up, uh, wouldn't back down, showed, number one, a complete obsession with media coverage, and number two, an incredibly thin skin. But I think that, you know, there's 40, maybe 40 and change percent of the country that thinks this was the media, this is the, the White House's line, you know, this is the media 
going after Trump relentlessly, making too much out of something that wasn't that big of a deal. And this is like this rinse, wash, and repeat cycle we have in the country, where now about half the country thinks the president basically isn't playing with a full deck, and some large number thinks that he can't get a fair shake. And it's going to come right down to November, and I think be a close call as to which one of these sides uh, tilts higher. But isn't the National Weather Service uh, event the bigger part of this story? The fact that the president said something that wasn't right, and the scientists and the government are being compelled to, one, not contradict the president, and then, two, put out a statement that seems to contradict other scientists and the government. And, well, <laughs> and also, the president's own defense also raises an interesting point. The president's defense is, I heard at one point that Alabama mm -hmm. was at risk. By the time I made my statement, Alabama was no longer at risk, and I insisted it was. I was like, well, what were you doing in that interval? And the answer was, I was taking no briefings because I was golfing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that uh, the, these, these stories, even the small ones, they reveal something about a unique process of government in which the president does not take his responsibility seriously. It's not just a matter of lying. It's a matter of not doing the work, and that's what necessitates the lie. Laura, uh, there were a number of stories regarding controversies surrounding Trump properties, from the vice president uh, staying at one in Ireland uh, to what we are now looking at with an investigation in Congress into properties in Scotland. Tell us what we need to know. Right. So the House Judiciary and House Democrats as a whole are expanding their scope, and they want to define very clearly what their impeachment inquiry would look like. And so on top of potential obstruction of justice uh, issues that came out from the Mueller report, they are adding to that by wanting to look into whether or not the president has violated the emoluments clause, uh, whether or not he is profiting off of the presidency with stays like Pence's in Dunbeg in Ireland, as well as the president's uh, suggestion that the G7 stay in Durrell, uh, at the Durrell Resort in Florida next year. And so Democrats want to add those to their impeachment inquiry. And we could see a vote as early as next week on, on adding this uh, extended scope. We will watch Trump, for that this week. Are uh, the Trump hotels a presidential tip jar? That's what we need to know. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll be back in a moment. We're back now with journalist Garrett Graff. He has a new book out called The Only Plane in the Sky. It's a detailed account of the morning of September 11th, 2001, told by those who lived through it. Garrett, uh, it's good to have you here. You know, in reading this, it was very powerful. These are first-person accounts. It's an oral history. Why did you write it this way? It's not a narrative. It's an oral history. Uh, and the goal was very much to capture the way that Americans experienced that day. You know, uh, we're coming up now, this week will be the 18th anniversary of the attack, and we're watching this uh, traumatic moment in American history slip from memory to history. And when we say never forget, I think we fail to remember just how traumatic, chaotic, and fearful that day actually really was to experience. So the goal was to tell the story, not the facts of the day, which we all know and remember, but the experience of the day, how Americans lived it coast to coast, morning to night. And reliving it is painful for a lot of people. Why do you think it's important to go through that? Well, I think you saw it actually even just this morning. We are still living with the consequences of that day. We are living, um, you know, still with the world that that day shaped. And it was shaped by the fear, the trauma, and the chaos that the policymakers experienced that day and their decision and their dedication that that should never happen again. And, you know, we, we now see American servicemen and women who were born after that attack, deploying for the first time to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq that that day spawned. And you talk not just to policymakers, people in the room, you talk to everyday folks who, who touched this in some way, including, and this, it stopped me when I hit it, the airline attendant who checked in, Mohammed Atta. Tell me about that. Yeah, and, and there are so many people that those attacks touched and affected, uh, including, you know, the, the ticket attendants in Dulles and Newark uh, and Boston and in Portland who checked in the hijackers. And they have these distinct memories of 
interacting with the hijackers and actually even in Portland and Dulles helping get them on board because they were showing up late to their flights that Warning day. Warning them, hurry up, you're going to miss the you're, flight. You're going to miss your plane, Mr. Atta. I mean, just a chilling, chilling comment in retrospect. Is there a character in here whose story really stood out to you? Uh, there are a lot of them um, because of sort of just what a human experience that day really was. I mean, a day like 9-11 strips away so much of the posturing and the artifice, uh, uh, you know, from policymakers uh, to first responders to the ordinary office workers who showed up in New York uh, or the Pentagon sort of expecting a normal Tuesday and found themselves amid that tragedy. You spoke for uh, to a number of people, including someone who hadn't spoken at all previously to the press, Commander Anthony Barnes. Now, he was the liaison between the Pentagon and Vice President Dick Cheney, who was commanding things that day. What did you learn from him? So uh, Commander Barnes uh, was sort of the director of the White House bunker on 9-11. Um, you know, the bunker under the North Lawn that is operational 24 hours a day has never been used before or since except for the morning of 9-11 when Vice President Cheney was hustled into that. Because remember, they thought Flight 93 was coming to hit the White House or the Capitol. And so I talked to people uh, and tell the stories in the book of the people who thought that they were going to die at the White House that morning. Uh, Commander Barnes was the Navy officer who was the one who actually asked Vice President Cheney for the authority to shoot down the hijacked airliners. He's never spoken before, and I spoke to him, and he said that he asked the Vice President three times because he knew just how momentous that order actually was, and he wanted to make sure that there was no confusion. And he recalls sort of just how annoyed Vice President Cheney was by that third time because Cheney had made the decision and knew that it was the right thing to do. A surreal order to be given. A surreal day from start to finish. I mean, you know, we tell this very neat story about 9-11 now that we know the whole attack took place in 102 minutes from the first crash to the collapse of the second tower. We didn't know that on 9-11, and that's one of the things that I really tried to capture in the book, was well into the afternoon. We were still dealing with planes that we thought were hijacked, and we didn't know whether Al-Qaeda had a whole other wave of attacks planned for the next day or the next month. I thought it was interesting towards the end of the book where you talked to school children yeah. and how they remember it. Um, it. Just small children and their memories. Uh, it's a great read. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thanks for having me today. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. And we honor those who died on 9-11 and after that, protecting U.S. interests as well as all the families they left behind. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.